So <clears throat> this morning's session is uh, modern application development. And I think we got parts that will be good for the people we've got in here. And we've actually got three things that we're going to do. We're going to talk about team services. And we're actually going to have a little bit of lab here where we're going to write a little bit of code and see how team services brings it all together for us. We're going to take a break. And then we're going to talk about web app cloud architectures and Azure. I think I renamed the section. And it's part of what was on the agenda. But we're really going to talk about architecture and components that are available to us which uh, both developers and architects are going to want to know about because this is how we're going to put stuff together. And the most important thing that we're going to do today is right in the middle is we're going to take a break. That's my, my favorite times of the day is when we take a break. So that said, you guys ready? OK. One other thing, this is at your pace. I'm here for you guys. So we got a lot to cover. We can go as deep or as wide as we want to. I'll let you guys, you know, if you guys want to dive deeper, say, hey, stop, talk to me more about that. I can go as deep as you want. If you guys are going, hey, no, that's really boring. I don't want to hear any more about it. Let me know. We'll move on. Sound good? All right. Has everybody had their coffee yet? Or caffeine or anything they need to get going? Cool. So with that said, we're going to start our first topic, which is Visual Studio Team Services. And as I like to sometimes refer to it as, where did you move my cheese? And nobody gets that yet. Has anybody worked with Visual Studio Team Services? No. All right, has anybody played with the Azure portal? OK. Are things where they were last week? No, that UI is constantly changing. And Visual Studio Team Services has actually gone through a lot of that. They're, they're, in fact, when I first put the agenda together, I was going to talk about the five main sections that make it up. It's now four. <laughs> so I'm going, thanks, guys. You guys are killing my presentation right off the get-go. Yeah, we, love, we love when they move our cheese. They do that every five years. About every five years? Yeah, apparently Visual Studio Team Services have been moving the cheese about every three months. So, it's, but it's been good ways that they've done it. It's kind of cool. So what is Visual Studio Team Services? So nobody in here has actually worked with it yet. So it's a suite uh, to achieve DevOps, uh, to kind of enable collaboration and whatnot. But it's got some major components to it. You've got a dashboard, which is a fancy way of putting together some information that I never actually see because I'm actually working in it, not looking at the things that are flying. But you've got a dashboard that can help you communicate uh, what build statuses are, uh, how many work items are in the queue, who's working on it today, how much stuff has moved. And you can customize the heck out of it, which is kind of cool. Um, managers and team leads tend, tend to like this. Uh, people who are getting stuff done look at it when they log in and never look at it again. Cool, cool feature. We've also got some code management features. We've got some work management features build and release management features, and test management features. We're going to talk about all of these. Uh, but I'm going to, again, I'm going to move through some of this. We'll go deep unless you guys want to talk further. But I want to go through these to give you some familiarity with what we're going to do in the lab, which is coming up after this. So the first one, and the one that I always care about here, is uh, code management. Um, it does host your code. And you've got two options. You've got uh, Team Foundation version control. Uh, and you've got Git. And I know this picture might be a little bit dated, but if you guys remember the matrix, you get to pick two. And it's hard to switch. Honestly, the, the truth is, for me, and I hope it is for you, and I'll try to convince you guys, Git's the way to go. Hands down. Don't even look at TFS. Honestly, if, some, if I was working for a company or a team that says we're using TFS, I'd go look for another company or another team. It's that bad in comparison. My personal choice. But don't let my personal choice guide you guys in that decision. Um, Git's been around forever. It's been around for since the 1980s, late 80s, right around there was actually when it was, when it was uh, initially developed. It's a distributed version control system, which is a little bit different than TFS. TFS is a central, uh, centralized version control system. And so major differences between that, but it gives you a lot more flexibility. You can have a lot more flexible uh, development workflows, code management workflows. I'll plug you in back here. But it significantly outclasses uh, uh, <coughs> what are the uh, competitors out there? You've got uh, CVS, um, SVN, Perforce, ClearCase. My opinion, again, I think it outclasses uh, Team Foundation version control. And reality is, I think most people are using it nowadays. There are some corporations that are still using TFS, but almost every single open source project out there is on Git. Some will be on Mercurial, which is a competitor to Git, but it's a small, small subset. 
And you've got some huge companies and projects that are on Git. You've got uh, the Linux kernel, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft. Most of Microsoft is actually now using Git. So we're going to talk about it in a little bit more. Who in here is familiar with Git? Who uses TFS? Who uses something else? Mostly SVN. Mostly SVN? OK. So I, won't, we, I actually was prepared to go deeper into it, because this is actually one of the very first classes where the majority of the audience has been using Git, so we won't go too far into it, unless you guys want to. No? <coughs> no? All right, we'll avoid. All right. <coughs> But again, for me, the biggest benefit is your flexible workflows. Uh, you've got centralized workflows. You can actually do centralized workflows. Uh, you've got one master repository. People clone the repository. They make their commits. They push it to the repository. The only big difference between SVN and that is that you're committing to master instead of trunk. You're done. It's very much the same. Feature branches. Uh, this is and the centralized workflow. Good for one person. Small team. Small project. Very controlled. Works well. Feature branches starts uh, giving you trying to use short-lived branches to put all the commits and organize them into one particular branch before bringing them in and merging them into that master branch. A lot better for keeping a cleaner commit history uh, in your source code when you've got larger teams, small to medium-sized teams. Uh, gives you a lot more control. You can now take advantage of pull requests to do code reviews and ensure code quality. You can put, uh, and talking in terms of, of uh, Visual Studio team services, you can put some uh, branch policies around that. So you can force people to use pull requests. You can get certain level of approvers before things get committed. You can force it to uh, build a branch before and pass a build before it actually comes into the development branch. Lots of cool things you can do there. That's the tooling on it. You can accomplish it with Git proper, but you gotta, you gotta do some work. You gotta communicate, right? Uh, Git flow, anybody familiar with Git flow? Okay, we got one person. Git flow is actually just feature branching, but with some rigor around it. How we're going to name our branches. We're also going to have some historical branches for releases, hotfixes, maintenance. Um, very powerful. Requires your team to have a lot more knowledge of it. And it's also a double-edged sword. One of the problems with feature branches and with Git flow is long-lived branches. Um, if you've worked in the world of SVN, yes, those still hurt in Git. Uh, and it, if you're not very rigorous about it and regimented, you're going to have some long-lived branches that's going to create some merge hell. Um, that's that. Yep. One of the things I've heard is very uh, powerful material. I don't know enough about Git to know if it's there in Git. Is you can do commits while you're disconnected from your repository. You can, you can do it. You can do that. Yeah, that's the that's the nature of a distributed version control system, right? Uh, the idea is I've got a centralized one. I'm gonna, when I say I clone it, I'm actually creating my own local repository. So I can turn the internet off, hit the power switch on the internet, turn it down for everybody do all my commits locally, power the internet back up, and then push my changes back out to that, to that uh, area. The forking workflow, uh, who's familiar with forking? Has anybody ever heard the term? All right, cool, everybody, or half the people at least have. Uh, this is actually very, very powerful. It's fundamentally different in the sense that there are multiple server-side repositories. So, and this works great when you're working cross organizations. Actually, a lot of open source projects work this way. I've got an open source project, or my company has a, a project, and I'm working with uh, uh, another vendor or another organization or a partner, and we're collaborating on this. <clears throat> but I want to keep tight control on what's going on into my project, my brand, and whatnot. So what I'll tell them to do is to create a fork of my repository. So they will actually clone the repository, put it up on their own Git server. Their, um, forking is actually very easy with GitHub. You hit a button and do that. Uh, Visual Studio Team Service is not quite there yet with forking. I heard it's coming, but we'll see where it's at. Uh, but they create their own. And basically, their teams work on, the, on their own repositories. And when an external team says, hey, we're ready to incorporate the changes, they send what's called a pull request. Visual Studio supports pull request. GitHub supports pull request. Bitbucket supports pull request by push a button, creates a ticket, notifies people, and automates the whole process. And you don't need the tooling. You can, I can send an email to say, hey, pull my stuff. Here's my Git repository. And somebody from the central team brings it down, copies that branch over, or that change set, builds it, makes sure it's up to par, and then commits it to the main repository. The drawback on this, it's a little bit slower to get things into that main development line. But on the flip side, you get a lot more control. You get to say when stuff actually goes in, and you can collaborate across organizations. So really cool. We're actually going to use that method for the lab, and it's going to be kind of fun. 
Any questions on the different workflows here? Anybody not sold on Git? I've done my job. See you guys tomorrow. I'm out of here. So code management, again, this is kind of just a screenshot of what it looks like. Uh, but <coughs> it, it's, if you guys are familiar with, uh, with uh, GitHub or Bitbucket or um, any of the other hosting tools that are available out there, it's, it gives you quick access to your main development branch. You can switch between branches. You can look at the files. You can view the source code right here in, in, in this environment to go look at it. Uh, provides you a history, and we can actually flip over and take a look at it here. I've actually got it up on my screen. And of course, it doesn't show up for you guys. So let me. This is not GitHub. This is Visual Studio Team Services. Okay. Uh, where's the stop presentation button? And slideshow. All right. So here we go. Kind of. Uh, Stash is a small subset of the Alaskan suite. It would compare more with, uh, with uh, Bitbucket is what it would compare with. It would compare with uh, uh, GitHub. So we're actually going to look at a project we made here. And is it now all in Bitbucket? Sure. I haven't worked with the Atlassian suite in a couple of days. Got another question. Your display is not centered properly, and it usually looks like a focus. Yeah, it's going to be right up there. I'm sorry about that. Um, it's a quick tour through the, the uh, areas here. You've got your files, and again, you can go into our source code and peruse through it. We're actually going to be working on this particular file, but it'll load it for you. You can actually edit it directly in here and commit it back into there so you don't even need to pull it down and look at it. It's kind of cool. Uh, historically, you can look at here's the stuff that's been happening. You can actually see when a build was successful around a particular uh, around a particular uh, commit. Um, what else do we got? It's on here. Lots of sorting, lots of filters. Um, branches, kind of cool. I've actually got two branches on here. I was started using the git flow pattern on here where you've got a master branch and a develop branch. But you can kind of see what's, what's going on, um, what the last actions between the two. You can actually see the, there's a pull request open from here to merge three commits over to the master branch. You've got your uh, pull request environment. And again, this is kind of one of those where you can go in here and you can say, hey, here's all the stuff that's being asked to be merged into master. You can review the file. So this is how we can do code reviews. And you can say, oh, here was a change to the readme file. Wow, that looks exciting. Good code. Uh, there were some changes down here on the index.html file. And we can peruse them and look at them. And very quickly, I can approve it. I can complete it, merge it in, build it, all that good fun stuff, quick and easy. If you're in a team lead position and you have to do a lot of code reviews for your team, you're going to be spending a lot of time in this. And it's, they've done a pretty good job with it so far. Questions around the code management area? Yeah? So this is using Git as the back end, not Git? Correct. Git is the back end. So we have a front end for Git? Yes. You have a front end for Git. It actually can use TFS as the back end, and you get a similar front end for it. Uh, not quite the same features, not as rich. You guys are too easy, no questions? I'm just curious how yeah. uh, the TFS team, the TFS is a Microsoft product, right? Yeah. How do they feel about Microsoft choosing Git? Oh man, you know what? I, I don't know. I, I really don't because I haven't talked to any of the TFS uh, develop, development team. I could say that if that was my project that I was working on, I'd probably be kind of sour about it because my project is kind of, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if they've got big plans for it. I, I've heard that new versions of TFS for on-premise is even shipping with the Git engine in it, so it's even going on-prem. Um, part of me would be excited that we're not trying to do things differently because we can, but rather doing what the community and the industry is doing, which I think is good. Um, I think if I was on the original team that decided, hey, we're going to go build TFS, I would have scratched my head and said, why? There's already something out there. Um, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say what they're thinking. Um, as a consumer of source control, I'm super happy about it. it. It's definitely, 
I've, I've been in the .NET space for a while. I've actually avoided working on a team or with companies that had TFS uh, for at least 95% of my career, and it's been great because that 5% really sucked, like bad. Like I still got to go see a therapist about it. Um, all right, so let's continue on. And of course, I don't know if it's going to start me back at the beginning here. Sure it is, but we're just going to cruise on through code management. So work management. This is going to be, uh, if you're in the Atlassian suite, this is going to be your equivalent of your JIRA. Uh, if you're in uh, GitHub, this is going to be the equivalent of your issues. If uh, in TFS, it's your work items and things that are in there as well too. It gives you a few different templates for your processes. You've got an Agile template, a Scrum template, a Kanban template. Um, thankfully, they didn't include a waterfall template. I would have shot myself. Um, but it's very flexible. You know, the, you've got uh, templates for items that are in there, so you can define your epics, you can define your user stories, you can define your features, you can define uh, bugs, issues. Um, you can add fields to them, make them more, I mean, it's totally, totally configurable to what you can do. So again, if you've worked with Jira, same thing. GitHub issues, not as flexible. They're very bare bones, but they're efficient for communication, so I like them. Um, in all of my years, well, not a lot of years, I've been working with Visual Studio Team Services. I've actually never modified the templates. They've been sufficient, which I like that too. I like to just kind of click and go. And that's pretty much uh, work management. It's not a lot to it, but this is where you're doing your work. Ties in really cool with the uh, source control uh, or the code management bits. So for example, if I've got a new user story and we're using uh, uh, the Git flow pattern or the feature branch pattern for our workflow, I can from there just say, hey, create my feature branch. Just click a button, creates my feature bran branch, applies our naming conventions and schemes uh, to it so then I can go ahead and pull it down, work on it locally, uh, make my changes and push it back up and it all gets tracked in there. Uh, with the pull requests, I can actually in my pull request say, hey, this is for this particular um, work item or set of work items. And as the pull request is completed and the build succeeds, it actually closes the work items automatically, cleans up our feature branches so we don't keep them around accidentally and have long-lived branches when we don't need them. So lots of really neat features to just automate a lot of that. Man, if you're in the full Atlassian suite, you're gonna get that integration between Jira and Bitbucket. If you're in the GitHub world, you're gonna get a lot of that as well in between the GitHub options that are on there. You guys want to hop over and take a look at this any deeper? Any more interest in going deeper into this topic? Do we have any project managers? All right, that's why we don't want to look at this. <coughs> Got it. This is where I spend about half my time. Um, half of it I spend coding, half of it I spend in build and release management. A lot of the teams, and has anybody in here not heard DevOps of DevOps? Anybody here doing DevOps? Yeah, we got so we got we're doing it, but I'm not sure we're doing it right. Is that what that is? Yeah, a little bit. There's a lot of agile, a lot of automation. In air quotes, right? Yep. So, build and release management in Visual Studio Team Services. These are your continuous integration and continuous deployment uh, features. Builds, integrate, releases, deploy. Pretty straightforward. Um, this is one of those where from a DevOps team, I'm gonna say that in air quotes too or whatnot, it's, this is where you get rid of all of the tedious, monotonous stuff that you need to do, right? So you've got somebody who uh, commits a build, it's in development, we need to move it to the QA environment. Great, somebody's gotta go out, pull down the code, build it, package it, copy that to a file server, Go to the QA server, format the box, uh, install uh, SQL server, IIS, deploy the packages out there, make sure the configuration files are right. And now that they're there, somebody can go and manually test it or we can run some automated tests on it, but we gotta do all that. And then once that's there, you get a release manager that reviews the results from the QA testing. They say, yeah, you know what, this is good. Uh, I think we're ready to move this into staging for UAT. Cool. So. That same person that put all those bits out there goes over to the staging servers, formats the staging servers, installs SQL Server, you've seen the repetitive nature here, installs IIS, installs the bits, configures the bits, 
and says it's ready. A lot of room for error. So continuous integration, this is where, it, and continuous deployment, this is where you can automate all of that. So with the push of a button, you can move it through this environment. You can automate the release approvals. You know, so we release to the QA environment. We're going to run a set of UI, automated UI tests, and we're going to run a set of integration tests, and we're going to run a set of whatever other automated tests that we have, load tests, stress tests, um, especially being in the cloud, we can actually create a QA environment that is of performance scale, run it for five minutes, shut it down so we only pay for five minutes, not have to invest on a whole new set of architect or infrastructure that's going to live forever that we're only going to use for 32 minutes out of a year. It does make a lot of business sense. If it all passes, you can actually have a uh, gate on there that automatically says, hey, all of my tests pass, go to the next setup. And it automates that whole process. And you may, you may even do that all the way out to production. You know, it's gone through all the tests, it's gone through staging, it's gone through all the approvals, gets all the way out there. So developer commits, goes live. That's really what I want to do. And so I say I spent about half my time in here. Well, take some time to get all this worked out. I've got to write PowerShell scripts. I've got to write, uh, and, and we'll look at it in Visual Studio Team Services for the build that we have in here, but uh, You've got some templates, you've got some modules that I can plug in to move my stuff around, to you know, execute MS build, to do all these other things that are in there. For some of the newer stuff uh, that's out there, or some of the custom stuff that we've written, I've got to run my own custom PowerShell scripts or other items. I've got to get those integrated. It takes some time, but once it's there, I don't have to do it again. And you've got one person doing that, not the whole entire team trying to figure it out, or a team of people trying to figure it out. I'd say for Windows-based environments, PowerShell is probably 95%. You know, it's definitely most of, of what you see out there for choice. Um, other ones, what we'll, I rarely ever see this uh, anymore, but it'll be just using a regular command line interface. And for Azure and automated Azure deployments, you're going to typically going to be running either the uh, command line tools for Azure or the PowerShell, uh, or the Azure modules for PowerShell. Anyway. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can do that. Um, in fact, yes. So there, there's, it's still in beta. It's still in beta. So there's actually, if you, it, yeah, it, it's, it, it's going to be cool. I, I, I'm not going to speak to what Microsoft is doing, but I actually built this whole demo in this lab that we're going to do, but I didn't open up Visual Studio. I didn't write a line of C-sharp. Um, not that it's a good thing or a bad thing. I love C-sharp. I think it's a great language. Uh, but it's, yeah, it, it, it's pretty awesome. And then as far as that is, what he's talking about, there's a feature in Windows 10. If you go into Windows 10 and you go to your, to your computer settings or advanced settings, you can turn on the developer mode. Go to your Windows features. Uh, go to the install or turn on, turn off Windows features. And there is a uh, Windows uh, Bash shell for Linux beta that you can turn on. You can actually get the command prompt for Bash. And if you guys are coming in from any of the Linux worlds, Bash is pretty cool stuff. For you guys that just came in, if you guys have laptops, we got plenty of space up here in Power Strips. You guys are welcome to join us. All right, so let's take a quick look. Uh, you asked about PowerShell. Um, uh, there, there isn't much to it. There really isn't. That's PowerShell. I mean, that's it's another command line interface, but it's it's built to not just work at the native level. It's actually pulling in .NET frameworks and other things to give you a lot of flexibility for what's there. So I can do stuff like uh, get Azure. Uh, let's see if I remember remote app. Click. I don't think I got anything on there from that, but get uh, Azure. Subscription. So this is <coughs> going in and querying Azure to find out uh, the subscription information for what I have on uh, on uh, what I'm connected to in my settings, right? So you can do what you can do from a, a command prompt, but more. A lot more. A lot more. So is this part of the team service? Uh, PowerShell? Yeah. No, that's just when that's so available on every Windows machine that's out there. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a different command line interface than the regular one. So if you remember the old command line interface, it was basically DOS based, yes. right? And you had some executables that you could run and commands that you could run, and it was kind of limited uh, as to what you could do. And so that's still around. PowerShell was built uh, to really give you a lot more scripting options. And I kind of like it. It's similar to more, more similar to the Unix side uh, scripting environments, but that's all it is. It's a scripting environment. And it is a command line environment, so I can in here, I can very quickly say, you know, show me my directory. Uh, or I could, I think it even supports LS, which is a ba uh, bash command. Yeah. Right? So you can kind of mix between Windows commands and. and you understand grep? <coughs> No, grep is not recognized as a command let. But yeah, it's not full Unix here, but it gives you a little, a little something extra as far as what you can do. Thank you. But for that, you do. You do. It, that's what I was saying uh, earlier. Think about between 80 to 90% uh, for deployments and automation, right. especially in IT organizations, it's going to be PowerShell script, uh, scripted. The reason IT loves us so much is you can actually uh, give, uh, you can do privilege management within PowerShell. So I can elevate permissions to a certain level where in Bash, you have two options. You're either administrator or you're not. Right? So I either give you the keys to the kingdom or I give you nothing. In PowerShell, I can I say, oh, you need keys to my garage? Cool, here's the keys to my garage. You need keys to the bank safe where I'm hiding $50 million? No, I'm not giving you that, right? So that's that's one of the power the powers from PowerShell from a, an operation op, ops perspective, right? It gives you a lot more granular control as to the permissions you grant the scripts as they execute, and you do it at the object level, not at the person who's. And you can do it as the person who's executing, but it's at the execution level and runtime of the of the scripting language. So let's take a look at uh, build management. And so this is one of those where I said, hey, uh, Visual Studio Team Services, where'd you move my cheese? This was actually used to be two sections. Build, one section. Release, another section. Now it's build and release. Okay, it didn't make me cry too much. I was like, I kind of get it. <clears throat> but, so what I've got here is I've actually, here you'll see my build history. And so again, this is all, is this build or release history? Where am I? I'm at releases, sorry. I'm lying to you. So my, these are, okay, so this is your build dashboard, per se. I actually don't really care for this. They just introduced this as well, too, which is kind of interesting. But I have two defined builds. I have a GitHub de development build and a development build. The reason we did the GitHub one is when we do our lab, we're actually going to use GitHub. Reason being is Visual Studio uh, Team Services is free for up to five people. And we got a lot more than five people in here. And so if I grant you all access, the credit card bill is going to go up, so we're going to use GitHub instead because it's a public repository, and we're going to go that way. But showing you here, I'm actually detecting changes on our Git environment and automating a build that goes around with that. Uh, here's the internal development build that I was also uh, set up for continuous integration. We can look at our definitions. Yes. Yeah. No, Git is the the source control engine, right? It's free. I can install that on my own server. I can install that on my laptop. Uh, in fact, that's the engine that GitHub is using to uh, to host source control. It's also the Git the engine that is now included in Visual, Visual Studio Team Services. It's also now going to be included in TFS um, server for on premise, from what I understand. Hopefully, I'm not lying about that. But last time I heard that it was that it was. Uh, but it's it's basically it's a source control engine. Okay, GitHub is a company that built a platform to create a UI in a collaboration space on top of that engine. Okay, and Visual Studio Team Services uses that engine and gives you another interface and a way to collaborate with the Visual Studio tools and the Microsoft tools on top of it. Now, I'm going to be very careful with what I say. I can use GitHub with Visual Studio, no problem. I can use Git. I can use Visual Studio Team Services with Visual Studio, no problem. I can use Bitbucket with Visual Studio, no problem. So this is really just, who do I want to host my source code? Do I want a company named uh, GitHub, a company named Atlassian that has a product called Bit Bitbucket, or do I want Microsoft to hold to, to host my source code? Because it's in their data centers. So GitHub is a 
it is the engine and different vendors are building different UI around mm -hmm. it. Like you have like own UI. Exactly. Own UI exactly. Own okay. You nailed it. That, that's it. Um, all right, so talking about the about the uh, the build. So I actually have three builds defined in here. I have a development build internally. We're going to look at the GitHub deployment development build because that's the one that we're going to be using. If we look at this, again, I can look at the at the history. Um, this is actually the summary of the last build uh, that came up that that uh, or of what's going on with the build. If we edit it, we can actually look at how does this actually work. And so this is our build definition. Uh, build definition is a set of steps uh, to build the code. And you can copy files, you can compile files, you can uh, run unit tests, you can do whatever else you need to to consider a build complete and flag it. Or to fail it, to say, hey, if it doesn't do this like it's supposed to, for example, it doesn't compile. I would say that the, that's a build failure. I don't think I've ever met anybody who said that's a build success. right? Uh, but you can do this. The, the other competitors to this, and again, I'm just giving you the competitive landscape. I want to say GitHub was starting to do something, but I'm not really sure if they ever did or didn't. Uh, Atlassian tools, if you're working with Bitbucket and Jira, this is going to be uh, Bamboo. Okay. If you're working with uh, um, JetBrains tools, it's going to be Team City. If you're working with, um, well, I'm just going to name some of the other ones. You have... Uh, Jenkins is another common one that you'll see out there. Anybody use Jenkins in here? I've got one Jenkins user. Okay. Um, there's a number. Maven is is the, I believe no Maven is not. That's the that's the package manager. Yep. NPM NuGet type thing. Yep. Codeship. That's ThoughtWorks one, isn't it? Or who did that one? Yeah. Okay. Gradle was the. Yeah. Thing to think about. Yep. Uh, cruise control was another one that was out there. Uh, there's a num number of ones that are out there, but this is not including the same suite. Yep. So for our lab, we're actually this is I, w I wouldn't consider this a, a uh, build definition that would use for production because it doesn't, doesn't do any testing. Uh, it's actually a very bad example of one, but figured I'd give you an example. All that it's doing is it's copying files to a build directory. Um, we have some JavaScript files and some index or HTML files. I don't even think I got any CSS. But we're going to copy it from the source location to a build location. And then these last two t steps is I'm publishing the client. This is going to be our, all of our HTML and JavaScript that is gonna be, we're going to use on the web browser. And then some back-end functions that we're going to use. We're going to talk about what those are later. But it publishes to two sections of the server so that when I go look at one of the builds, I'm just going to come back here to build definitions. Hopefully I can navigate through here. If I look at this uh, most recently comp completed build, <coughs> here's my artifacts. And I have my client artifacts right here. And we can explore it if you guys want to see what's in there. Like I said, it's, it's a uh, HTML file and two JavaScript files. And then we have our functions um, artifact which is composed of three different functions that we're going to deploy to Azure as well, too. What are those written in? Uh, these are going to be written in JavaScript. Okay. Yep. In fact, if I open it up, it is a JSON file and a JavaScript file and all of these. And we'll look at the, these more in the, on the second half of this morning's uh, lecture. How am I doing on time? We're almost at 11. Okay, I think we're still good. Got a question? Yeah, in terms of the architecture, Yeah. Where does the data sit and where does it keep it? Okay. So all my source code is on my Git server that is in the cloud with Microsoft right now. Oh. All of it. Yep. Okay. It's all out there. It's secured. I've actually, uh, the, all these repositories are private. You know, you can't be shared. Microsoft, from what I understand, doesn't have access to them as well either. They have access to the environment and they maintain it, but it's out there. It's encrypted and it's secured for you, right? Uh, the build itself is actually also hosted by Microsoft. And in, I'm using the free tier, which gives me a limit of to how many hours of build cycles I get uh, that are out there. But you can purchase more and expand uh, your ability to do 
uh, parallel builds, multiple builds. I think you can set it up to have over like 20 parallel builds at the same time if you want to. And really powerful for big teams uh, or multiple projects and repositories, which is fine too. But it's all done in the cloud. So in terms of what I need to, to do locally is I need a web browser and an internet connection, and I can do this. Follow-up. Yeah. So I run, I run GCC. What, how do you tell uh, Microsoft, whatever, build farm, which OS, which, which compiler, I mean, is that, do they have all the compilers in the world or just, just uh, their own compilers? Y yes and no. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, will, I definitely will. Um, ah, not in a new tab, just open the link. All right, so in here, this is uh, the general settings for my build definition. In here, you have this concept of demands. And in here, I can go in and say, hey, I have a new demand for this. And, uh, yeah, that's it. So I can actually tell it, hey, I need a host that has GCC on it. So I'm demanding a host that's available to me that where GCC exists. I don't know for sure specifically if, it has, if GCC is available on them. My guess is yes, because most of these hosts are actually now Linux-based on the back end. Um, so I'm sure there's some that are Windows-based, but you can, tell, you can put your demands as far as what, that, what you need from a build environment out there for it. And as far as your build targets, that's going to be based on like your architecture if you're doing 64-bit versus 32-bit. Uh, you're actually going to pass that in as a variable into the build. So you're going to have a 32 build, build specification with the variables to do your 32-bit output. Or you're going to have two build steps. One that builds your 32-bit, say, and you'll pass the parameters into GCC to say, give me my 32-bit build. Uh, and another step that'll say, and put it in this directory, and then you're going to have another step that'll say execute GCC with the 64-bit architecture parameters and put it into this other directory. So the make file of our project would also be would be part of the project, and this would also get on. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so, and to do that one specifically, and and here what I would actually do is I could actually add a build step, and in this case I don't know that I've got one for GCC that's in here built into it. No, I don't. Uh, but I could, in theory, add a command line uh, argument, and in here it could come in and say, hey, once you've, and again, I could move this, this could be my first step if I wanted to. Like I could put it up here and say, you know, before you copy files anywhere, uh, run uh, GCC with these arguments that are in there, and, or run my make file, execute my make file. Um, in that particular environment, and you could do that as well too. Thank you. Thank yeah. Good questions. Any other questions as far as the build definition before we move on? I see the save there. What does this? Can you save this locally, and how does it get saved? Can I save this locally, and how does it get saved? This up here. No, this. Um, it's up there. Uh, this is in in the in. Yeah, this is on their server. This is where I'm putting in all the steps. Uh, I don't know if there's actually a way to export this. I've never had to do it, never had a need for it, to be honest with you. But it's basically, I'm coming in here and I can add new steps to this build, and I could save it so that it, all new builds start using those new build steps. Or I could save it as a draft and not necessarily apply it yet, or I could copy the build and create a different one that has different triggers that are on there. And you'll notice the triggers that I have on this one, it's actually set up for uh, <coughs> continuous integration. And I've actually, I'm asking it to listen to, uh, I've got a copy of this repository on GitHub. So it's listening to, to GitHub, looking for changes. And when there's a, a set of changes, I've got some exclusions and inclusions. I'm actually telling it, look at my develop branch. When there is a change in the develop branch, pull that down and build it. That's, what that, that's, how, that's what's triggering the build. Any other questions about builds before we go to releases? Okay. So releases are very similar to builds, except they have a different purpose. <coughs> Rather than compiling our source code and running tests, and making sure that a build is good, these guys will actually take the artifacts from a build and put it somewhere. In this particular case, and we'll look at uh, one of the builds here, we have this uh, GitHub development release. And the only reason that I called this different than the other one is because of the triggers that are on it. What this guy's actually doing 
is set up for continuous deployment. So he's listening for a successful uh, build from our GitHub development build definition. So whenever I've copied and published the files successfully, he's going to pick it up and run with the ball. Yes. No. No. It's on GitHub. Yeah, in fact, it's it's right here on GitHub. We're going to look at this. So I actually integrated GitHub with my Visual Studio team services. So if if you're on GitHub today and you're saying, hey, I like the build tools, but I like GitHub for my issue management and my uh, uh, my repository management, my code management. Okay, you can do that. You don't have to buy all in. You can buy part of it. And again, for a team of five or less, you get it for free with the usage limits that are around it. You know, there's always a free. I hear that a lot. It's kind of like agile, but it's free. Um, at any rate, looking at the uh, looking at the re release definition here, uh, we've got a set of environments. So you have environments and then tasks per environment. So this is where I would say, here's what I want. Here is my development environment, and what I want it to do is actually and my development environment is going to be in Azure. I'm going to say copy uh, files to an Azure blob, and in fact, what we're actually going to do in this one, if we look at it in detail, we're going to copy the client files out to an Azure blob. You'll see, you'll get why when when we circle back on it. If that's successful, I could add another environment, let's call it QA or staging or whatever I want to, and you could repeat that process. And in that environment, maybe I'll load it, run a load test. So I'll actually change the process a little bit and add some additional things to do with it before I move it to the next environment. But you can stage this across multiple environments with either manual approvals or automatic approvals. In this particular case, I'm saying I don't need any approval. When we have a good build, you push and you release it to the development environment. That's all this guy is doing. And we, like the this is the deployment part, right? So the first part was integrating it together, which is the, the build part. And this is the release part. This is the deployment out to Azure. And in this case, I'm telling it, uh, look at uh, the source in the client. Um, copy it over to our Catapult Austin subscription collect connection that I have out here. Find the Azure blob with this name and put my files out there. That's all that that's doing. And so by doing that, what we're actually going to see as we go into the lab here pretty soon is we're going to write some code, we're going to commit it, and it's going to go live. Just like that. And, and that to me is the real power behind um, continuous integration, continuous delivery, or continuous deployment, it's continuous delivery. Going back to our presentation, if you guys are good, everybody good? Okay. Any more questions about build or release management before we go on to our last topic in Visual Studio Team Services? Okay. So test management. Do we have anybody in here who still does manual testing? Okay. Yeah, everybody does. I'll talk about automation as much as I want to, but yeah. No, that's fair. So test management section of uh, Visual Studio Team Services is predominantly for manual testing. It's for creating your test plans, creating your test cases, uh, executing them, running those tests, and documenting what happened during those tests, and creating work issues out of them that, that were in there. And the whole UI is built in there. You can tie it to specific builds, product sprints, iterations. You can have multiple plans uh, for the product as a whole, plans for a particular sprint in case you're doing something different. Yes and no. So the hooks for the Gherkin stuff and the automated stuff, like if you're doing Selenium and that kind of thing, and it's automated, run that in your build. Make that part of your build process and put the, out the output could uh, potentially feed into it. I haven't actually tried it. To view the specifications? I don't know that it does. I'd have to double check that. To be honest with you guys, I don't spend much time in it because when somebody says manual test, I go yuck and I quit my job. Um, I hate manual tests. I really do, but this environment's pretty slick. I've had some people uh, spend some time in it. Actually, the guys that I was working with that last looked at this, they were on the Atlassian suite and they were using Jira for their work management and their QA folks needed some manual test management stuff, so they used Zephyr. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. 
Uh, and it was cool, and then they looked at this and said, wow, this is better. So I'll take that for what it is because I trust their opinion more than mine. There is another component on this for uh, load testing. So you can create some load tests um, that are in there and run them manually to review the results and that kind of thing to feedback into the system. And so everything that I see out there, I consider this out of band. In other words, not necessarily going to happen during the build, but you could have during the deployment, you could have a deployment out to a QA environment. QA can come in, execute their test plans, run some load tests on that environment, and once they pass it and give their approval, now somebody can go back to the, to the uh, release and hit the button to say it's approved to go to the next stage, whether it's production or another environment for some additional testing. So that's how you tie the two together from a process perspective. Do you guys want to look at the UI? Okay. And I encourage you guys, go just Google Visual Studio Team Services, create an account, it's free. All you think is all you need is a Microsoft account, create your own personal, they have it for individuals, it's free. You, unlimited private repositories, you get the builds, you get the test management, go check it out. It doesn't, doesn't hurt. Huh? For a team of up to five. But I'm saying for everybody single, like when I heard that it was gonna be free, I've got my own private one that I don't share with anybody because I'm greedy like that. So I've got my own private Visual Studio Team Services. In fact, you'll see my name right up at the top in the domain. Yep, that's right, that's Alonzo Robles dot visualstudio.com. Nobody else can have that. It's me. Yeah. Yep. Nope. You can tie it together. You have to go up there to create your accounts and to tie them together, but you can tie your subscription to it. Yep. All right. So this is the test interface. Yeah, test rails. Uh, Zephyr was the other one. Uh, clear case, uh, maybe. That was the rational one, if I remember correctly. Oh, uh, yeah, they had a test one. I forget what it was, but it, it, yes, one of those. Um, yeah. I, I, I honestly try to avoid those like a plague. They, they, they really do. But I get it. I mean, there are some times where you need to do some stuff uh, to get some manual sign off because of regulatory compliance or uh, you're working on a legacy product that didn't have stuff automated and we still got to maintain the manual test. I get it. It takes time to convert. You just can't just flip a switch and just say, automate at the full regression suite. Yeah, that takes time. Uh, and this is where you would do that. Uh, so again, you kind of go through, you create your test plans, um, and it's I actually got a development test plan in here that we could look at, I think, or I did. Okay, so this is my test plan, you give it a name. Uh, here's your set of tests, you can come in here and you can create your test case, or you can create, you can give it a random, uh, you can actually create test case using grind. I don't know what grind is. You guys are testers, have you ever heard of grind? Or grid, sorry, grid, not grind. Grid, okay, cool. I don't know what it is, I haven't played with it. Uh, but you do get uh, some charts from your, test results. Um, you can provide parameters for your test plans. You can do some configurations here where you manage my testing for a particular OS browser combination. What am I running the test on? You can track all that. So you create your test plan. You're saying I'm targeting all of these things. Great. That means I've got 25 test cases to execute that test on against that. Uh, as you're executing them, you can track your runs. You can explore the results that are out there. Uh, this machines thing, this was actually kind of cool because you could spin up Azure VMs to go and execute these things on, so with the right OS and stuff combo. But I'm going to give you guys the disclaimer right now. Machine groups will be removed in the future. I don't know what they're going, doing with this, but there's a change coming, so I'm not going to spend more time on it. And then you've got the uh, load test environment. And this one's kind of cool. You can create a number of uh, different tests. You can use an HTTP archive, so that's kind of when you're, I believe that's when you go in Internet Explorer and you kind of save this web page and it creates that HAR file that has all the images and CSS files and whatnot. You can upload that whole thing and run some tests on that. Uh, you can do a Visual Studio web test and integrate it with the uh, test features of Visual Studio. You can do uh, Apache JMeter and set up tests using JMeter. And you can do some URL-based testing, which is good for testing uh, responses from a REST API or making sure that a particular web page exists and things that, that are out there. That's test management 
Honestly, as far as I know it, I don't know it very well. So that's my disclaimer on that particular area. Questions? Coffee. All right, just checking y'all, checking y'all. All right, so last but not least. Huh? Is that Yeah. Um, there is a concept of a web test project, I believe, in Visual Studio. I honestly, again, it's I had don't do much with manual testing, so I can't tell you much everything that it does. Do we have anybody in here who uses Visual Studio web tests? All right, so I will refer to my friend Google on that. I'm sure he will tell you all about it. Yeah. Is it, have you guys seen that website? Uh, let me Google that for you. Dot com. Oh my God, I love it. So, so it's basically a website that kind of uh, animates somebody typing it into Google for you and clicking search and then takes you to the search results. So every now and then somebody's asked me if I know anything about this and I'll go to that website and say, let me Google that for you and I'll send them that link and it'll bring up Google. <laughs> it's like I'm typing it out for them and it brings up the results. I'm like, there you go, glad I could help you. It's an awesome website, check it out. Let me Google that for you, dot com. Yeah. All right, so with that said, I'm bring this uh, back up. All right, we're actually about an hour in. We're actually due for a break right around now, but we're not gonna go on break just yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the lab started. If you guys wanna go through the lab and then go on break, or if you guys wanna break while we're doing the lab, let, let me hand, who's actually gonna write code with me? Okay, for the, you guys, those of you guys that are not going to ride code with me, if you guys want to go take a break now, you're welcome to. If you guys want to hang out and see what we do, that's fine too. But we're going to go into our next topic, which is the lab. 